I'm very happy to be here. I'm actually really pleased that we're doing this entire meeting. I think it's an important meeting to have because I've done nothing but treat people with diabetes for my whole career. And Jeff Guterman pointed out that we first met each other 31 years ago. And I think I've known Ellie Ip and Mayor Davidson for about that long as well. So I've been around and I've really spent all of my career trying to help people with diabetes get better care. But as it turns out, we end up not only seeing the microvascular complications in our patients, they die of their macrovascular complications. And so when Theodore asked me to give this talk, I said, oh, I don't want to do this talk. And he said, well, this is the most important talk you can give. So I gave in and I said, all right, I'll put a talk together. Now, I have all sorts of financial relationships because I do a lot of consulting for all sorts of companies. I try to help them develop better products and I do research. I also am a consultant to the FDA and I work in the FDA device committee to try to create better devices for treating diabetes. So I get a lot of experience and exposure that helps inform what I know when I teach. Now, the article that was published about three months ago in the New England Journal of Medicine was the article that made me believe that what I have been doing for my career has meaning. And that was this article which looks at changes in diabetes related complications in the United States from 1990 to 2010. And basically what it says is that what we're doing is helping. Now sometimes you wonder, right, because we're giving all these pills, we're saying here take this handful of pills every morning, here take this shot, here do this thing, and yet we are making a difference. And clinical trials will never tell us if we're doing it right until later, right? Clinical trials take so long to finish, and none of those clinical trials, or many of them, aren't real world. We're real world. And so what this data is, is truly real world data that shows in these domains acute myocardial infarction, stroke, amputation, end stage renal disease, and death from hyperglycemic crisis, there's a significant, very significant reduction over this period of time. The biggest reduction is in these macrovascular events, and arguably because we're using statins and treating blood pressure better. But regardless, we're making a difference, and we're not hurting people, which is also very important to note. Now, we didn't see the same change down here in individuals without diabetes. They're not getting as much better. On the other hand, they didn't start out nearly as high. They didn't start out nearly as at risk for macrovascular events, so they didn't see the same reduction. And in fact, that's something that's very important to me. So when you look at LDL cholesterol levels, we know that as LDL cholesterol levels go down, so do clinical event rates. And we now have a whole bunch of cardiovascular disease trials that show that lowering LDL cholesterol with statins, and now that we have the data from Improve It with azetamide, will lower the risk of cardiovascular events. So there's this amount of risk that's attributable to LDL. But every single time I hear that one of my patients is keeled over from a cardiac event, I immediately run to their chart, right? I want to see, did I do something wrong? What's their LDL? Am I really taking good care of this patient's cardiovascular risk? And you know what? They're in general really well controlled. My patients die with an LDL cholesterol of 65, with a blood pressure of 120 over 80. They really look good, good, sort of good, A1C, but you know what? They're still dying. And the reason is, is because there's a risk, there's a big risk of cardiovascular disease that we can't account for by LDL cholesterol, and we really can't account for by hypertension. Some of it's glucose, some of it's other, some of it is disease duration, which I'll talk about. But regardless, my notion is we need some better way to help reduce this cardiovascular disease risk. And I'm going to talk about what I think is important in terms of doing this. Now, first of all, let's look back at some of the trials that we have. The United Kingdom Prospective Diabetes Study is probably the best study we'll ever have in people with type 2 diabetes. 
It was done in the UK in primarily Caucasian individuals who were newer onset with their type 2 diabetes. And they followed them in the treatment part of the study for about 10 years, and then they followed them subsequently. So they do this long-term follow-up. And in the initial cohort, they did not see a statistically significant reduction in myocardial infarction, although it's pretty close. It's 0.052 in terms of its p-value. But as they follow the cohort for 10 more years, this now becomes significant. And that's shown a little bit more graphically on this slide. It's not going to overwhelm you with significance, but you see here initially this wasn't significant. But as you drift down over time, you see a significant reduction in macrovascular events. This is myocardial infarction. And this was the main cohort. It was conventional therapy versus sulfonylurea insulin therapy. And if you look at the smaller cohort that was treated with metformin, you see a significant reduction both initially and then over time. So at least in UK PDS, in that subset of overweight patients treated with metformin, there seemed to be an additional improvement in cardiovascular risk reduction compared to that seen with insulin and sulfonylurea agents. And in either case, it wasn't worsening cardiovascular events, it was improving them. So if you look at a meta-analysis of the type 2 trials, and meta-analyses have all of these limits in terms of methodology. They're kind of an idea. To me, meta-analyses don't prove anything per se, but they give you a sense. And the sense you get from this meta-analysis that looks at five of the key type 2 studies is that it tips towards improvement. Intensive treatment seems better in terms of glycemic trials and coronary heart disease events or risk. So, okay, better glycemic control may be better. But we haven't seen these big improvements, not the improvements that we thought we'd see. And Ted Mazzoni, who works at, in Chicago, who's with me, or at least until I rotated off the board on the Board of Internal Medicine exam writing committee, really looks at why it is we don't see a better impact on cardiovascular disease risk and reducing hyperglycemia. And there's been a number of trials, problems in recent clinical trials. One is that our event rates have fallen too much. Now, I personally, as a clinician, don't, don't consider this a big problem, but people aren't dying from cardiovascular disease at the same rate they used to, so that's a problem for anybody doing a clinical trial. In some of the trials, the A1C differences haven't been very big. So if you looked at the UK PDS differences, it was an A1C of 7 versus 7.9, not a huge difference. A much bigger problem, I think, is that the period of the intervention and observation is too short. Three years isn't going to tell us much. This is a process that may take 10, 20 years. And we also need to start the intervention early. If somebody already has vasculopathy, if they already have macrovascular disease risk, we may not be able to show as much a benefit as if we start when they're younger and make a difference earlier. So what Ted says is don't discount the benefits of managing hyperglycemia in terms of macrovascular disease risk. Now remember, Mayer told you a lot about microvascular risk. If you don't want to go blind on dialysis or have neuropathy, lower your blood sugars. But I'm focusing on macrovascular risk. So we know the microvascular disease benefits are well established. I think we need to really look at the benefits of tight glucose control in cardiovascular disease and look at this residual risk problem. And also know that no matter what you do, you must treat lipids and you must treat blood pressure. That's just part of treating diabetes. So a number of years ago, I was asked to be on the committee that wrote the most recent guidelines in terms of the management of type 2 diabetes. And these were published in 2012. And they're going to be updated in January of 2015. So the updated version of these is coming out in January. When they put together this committee, they chose five people from the United States and five people from Europe. My sense was is that given they chose four men and one woman from the United States and four men and one woman from Europe, that I was kind of the balancer. But regardless, this is how the committee was formed. 
And unfortunately, Michaela died last year at the age of 51, so I am now the remaining female on this committee and the sort of peacemaker amongst the various factions. <laughs> As that is, we've been able to come up with a few conclusions, and I'm going to show you why we came up with the conclusions that we did. This slide, this table, is really the headline, okay? So I'm going to walk you through this. This looks at these studies, five studies, microvascular risk, cardiovascular risk, and mortality. And in the gray are the short-term sort of initial phase of these studies. So in the UK PDS study, which I told you was a long-term study looking at new onset type 2s, they showed a reduction initially in microvascular risk that was sustained over time no initial significant reduction in cardiovascular disease, but over time they showed a reduction. Mortality, no difference early, but later a difference. And in DCCT, which is in type 1s, which Mayor showed you that graph of in terms of the retinopathy, again, microvascular risk reduction, no cardiovascular disease benefit early, but they showed it later, and no significant differences in mortality. UK PDS, I think, made everybody get slightly greedy. So everybody said, oh, gee, if we get the A1C even lower, maybe we'll show a better benefit. And let's pick sicker patients. So instead of picking newer onset patients, they picked people who had a longer duration of disease, and many of whom had already had macrovascular disease. They tried to get the A1Cs down to less than six in the intensively treated group, and they compared them to a control group where their A1Cs are about 7.5%. The study was stopped after three years because there was an increase in mortality. In those people where they were trying to push the A1Cs down too low, they had an increased risk of dying. Now, you're all going to tell me that that's because of hypoglycemia, and I'm going to tell you that that's wrong. I'm also going to tell you that we're never going to know why there was that increase in mortality, but those patients were aggressively treated with every known diabetes drug, and most of them were on insulin. Ad Cord Advance and VADT were also shorter-term studies in higher-risk patients, and all of these studies show an improvement in microvascular risk with an improvement in A1Cs, but they also didn't show an improvement in cardiovascular disease, and they showed no differences in mortality. <laughs> so let's look at what happened in Accord, because that really affected the committee in terms of their decisions about treating diabetes. This is a study that is a meta-analysis of sorts, looking at patients who have severe hypoglycemia in three of the trials, the three shorter ones, Accord, Advance, and VADT. And it looks at annual mortality. And in blue is the mortality in patients who don't have an episode of severe hypoglycemia. And in yellow is the mortality in those who have an episode. So what it shows is that it doesn't matter if you're in the intensively treated group or the standard group. It doesn't matter if your A1C is 6 or 10. If you have an episode of severe hypoglycemia, it increases your risk of mortality, of dying. We don't know, and we don't even necessarily think, that that's what caused you to die, but it's a bad signal, okay? Your risk of dying within the next year or two is significantly increased. But that wasn't what caused the increased death in Accord. And in fact, we just don't know. So from Accord, and again, this is a lot of what we were discussing when we were trying to make guidelines, is that we know that patients with type 2 diabetes who have an episode of severe hypoglycemia are at increased risk of death, regardless of the intensity of glucose control, and that the increased death seen in Accord in the intensive glycemia arm cannot be attributed to the increased rate of severe hypoglycemia. So it means we have to individualize targets and we have to be really careful in how we treat patients, particularly our older patients at high risk for cardiovascular events. It makes sense to try to avoid severe hypoglycemia. So this is the initial 
chart that we came up with when we wanted to talk about treating diabetes. The brilliant headline that came out of two years of hard work is that metformin is the best drug for treating type 2 diabetes. That's a revelation, right? We all know that metformin is the best drug for treating type 2 diabetes, and that's not going to change. We've had it since 1957. It's as old as I am. It's a really good drug, okay? I'm going to talk a little bit more about it. Then we decided that we couldn't tell you what to choose for your second-line therapy because all the drugs work. There's not a really good way to differentiate amongst them. We don't go into discussing some of the lesser-used drugs like alpha-glucosidase alpha inhibitors or drugs like cyclocet because those are rarely used in the United States. But of the main drugs we use, there's good data that combining them works, and they have pluses and minuses, but each different practice setting, each different patient has different choices for the second-line drug. There's even less data to de define what our third-line drug should be, and that's part of why our little committee in the county spends so much time trying to help you all figure this out, because what we did when we did these international guidelines is say, take these and customize them for your practice setting. And that's really what we've been trying to do for the county. The thing we really failed at is the last part of this. So we said if three drugs fail, well, put people on basal insulin, but then go to some intensive insulin regimen. Well, in my personal experience, intensive insulin regimens with premial insulin and basal insulin and these complicated regimens don't work all that well in most of our type 2 patients because it's very hard to get them to give five shots a day and to do these complicated ways of treating diabetes. And in fact, a lot of those patients don't necessarily get much better in terms of A1C. So the next guidelines are going to talk a lot about how we combine drugs with insulin in order to help avoid even needing some of these intensive insulin regimens. But really, you need to take your patient and see if they can handle the complexity of a more intensive regimen. I don't think intensive insulin regimens are the end-all and be-all. You're going to hear from Mayer in a later talk about some suggestions of how to make this make more sense. I talked about individualizing targets, and I actually take every patient and write on their chart, I note what my target is with that patient. And I also work with the patients on their targets, because I can tell a patient a target, and if they don't own it, they're never going to get there. So I really work with goal setting, target setting with my individual patients to try to get them to where they should be. Now, I am a big believer in lifestyle, okay? Anybody can out-eat any drug you get them, right? You don't have any control if someone's not going to mind your diet, A. And if they don't take it, they're not going to get better either. So I am one of the principal investigators in the Look Ahead study. This is a big, long trial that was designed to look at the benefits of weight loss and exercise in improving or reducing cardiovascular mortality in people with type 2 diabetes. I want to point out that our site in Los Angeles was a site that showed the world that people living in East Los Angeles with fewer resources can respond to a lifestyle intervention as well as you can in Boston or New York or anywhere else. We had a wonderful team of interventionists who used culturally appropriate tools and got our patients to lose weight and exercise and improve their outcomes. So it's possible to implement lifestyle changes here, it just takes resources. Overall, the whole group did well. People lost weight. They lost about 8.6% the first year. There was a weight regain, but they had about a 6% loss in weight throughout the study. The control arm lost weight too, because as you age, there's a nat natural decrease in weight, but there still remained a significant difference between the two arms. The primary outcome was negative. Basically, there was no difference in terms of macrovascular disease risk between the control and intervention group at 10 years. Now, I thought this was slightly unfair because if you look at the SOS study, even bariatric surgery takes 10 years to start showing a difference in terms of macrovascular events. And we didn't show a difference, but we showed a difference in a thousand other things, right? Joint pain, sleep apnea, depression, all sorts of things that actually like matter for your life while you're living it. So we didn't show a difference in macrovascular events. But then if you ask the question that I ask, which is, I'm not a trialist, I'm a clinician. And I said, well, 
Maybe, maybe the whole group didn't do so well, but what if you look at subsets? So everybody getting into look ahead had to be able to do a full-on maximal treadmill test. So they didn't have cardiovascular disease that was significant coming in. But 11% had already had a macrovascular event. So if you dump those out of the analysis, again, you're not supposed to do this statistically, but it's okay, I did it. And then you say, is there a threshold? Is there a point at which weight loss does reduce your macrovascular risk? And the answer is yes. If you were in look ahead and you lost 10% or more of your body weight at one year, you did have a significant reduction in macrovascular events. So the way I look at this, if you lose 6% of your body weight, you can prevent getting diabetes. We know that from the diabetes prevention program. But if you lose 10% or more, you can actually help reduce cardiovascular risk. And this just shows you the trajectories. About 35% of our patients lost 10% or more of their weight. And of those, about 42%, shown here in the bottom green line, really maintained that 10% or more weight loss. And then the others were somewhere in between those who regained all the weight and those who didn't. But you actually can, in a subset, just with a lifestyle intervention, get people to lose weight. But what was our lifestyle intervention? Well, it was giving people really good advice but it was also giving them meal replacements because the way they lost weight was that they had the option of having one or two meals a day that were slim, we gave them slim fast glucerna or HMR depending on the phase of the study. But our patients did so well because we took away choice. So that instead of having to decide what they were going to eat for breakfast and whether it was healthy or not and how many tortillas it was, they just drank a shake. And so it made it simple. So the improvements in weight, those who lost 10% or more, were the ones who used the most meal replacements, and they were also the ones who exercised the most. Now, the exercise itself didn't cause the weight loss, but that was a really good indicator that a patient was adhering to the intervention. So don't forget lifestyle. And we didn't yet analyze look ahead for diet composition, but I think what you eat, as well as the quantity of what you eat, matters. Now, I'm just going to quickly go through the drugs to tell you what I think the impact is on cardiovascular risk. So metformin, which I think is a great drug, may have a benefit in terms of reducing cardiovascular risk. And that idea comes from the UK PDS data that I showed you previously. So finally, urea agents have long been argued that they may or may not cause an increase in cardiovascular risk. This goes back even before my time in terms of the UGP, UGDP data. But the point is, is we know severe hypoglycemia causes an increased risk of mortality. So when you use sulfonylurea agents, be sure not to cause hypoglycemia. Use lower doses, discuss this with your patients, tell them how to make sure that they eat to watch out for signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia. So that's the key to sulfonylurea agents. TZDs actually may be helpful in terms of reducing cardiovascular disease risk, even though they do cause an increase in plasma volume and can cause congestive heart failure. This is a meta-analysis done in 2007 that was presented to the FDA that shows a reduction looking at pioglitazone, not rosiglitazone, in terms of cardiovascular events. DPP-4 inhibitors, we don't know whether or not these will reduce cardiovascular events. I don't think they will. Um, I'll show you some big trials in a second. But there is a concern that saxagliptin may increase congestive heart failure risk. Um, that is unknown whether this is a class effect, but we'll see in due course. GLP-1 receptor agonists have a whole list of potential cardiovascular benefits. They help causing weight loss. That's probably a good thing. This is the laundry list of things that these drugs are supposed to do to help reduce cardiovascular disease risk. Do I think they will or not? I don't know because I don't have clinical outcomes trials. We will. I do think losing weight is a good thing for you, but we have a lot more data that we need to get before we can say these do. This looks at the Inquitin cardiovascular trials, and I can tell you that we have the EXAMINE trial, that that was in high-risk patients who'd had recent acute coronary syndrome, no increase or decrease in cardiovascular um, events. 
There was Save Her Timmy, which was saxagliptin, which was a very big trial, and that's where we saw the increase in congestive heart failure, but not an increase in other risk. TCOS is coming out soon. That's 14,000 individuals on citagliptin, and the rest of all these trials are going to be many years net away from now, except for lixazenatide, which we'll report in January. SGLT2 inhibitors, well, these drugs help with lowering blood pressure. They help with weight loss, but they also raise LDL cholesterol a bit. So do these reduce cardiovascular disease risk? Again, I don't know. We're going to have big outcomes trials coming out, but not for five to 10 years. So what I say is make sure if the LDL goes up that you treat it to lower it back down. Um, and in using these agents, I often am able to reduce the blood pressure medicines. So it's kind of a balance. So in conclusion, I think that there's all sorts of great ways to help our patients reduce their cardiovascular disease risk. Statins, controlling blood pressure, and aspirin are headlines. But second to that, I think we need to use diabetes drugs that don't cause hypoglycemia, or if we do, be very careful to minimize hypoglycemia, particularly severe hypoglycemia, and drugs that can cause hypoglycemia. Tight control early, I think it's key to all that we do, and never ever forget about lifestyle because that can always help our patients do better. Thank you. Great talk, Great talk Dr. Peters. Um, some questions? Sorry. So the question was, how reasonable is it to get a patient to take SlimFast when um, they're eating and living with a family that may not be doing that? The thing is as follows. First of all, I think cereal is the single worst thing for breakfast known to man. It's just like eating a bowl of sugar. That's what I tell my patients. You're most insulin resistant okay, in the morning. Okay, so we made a mistake in our breakfast uh, choice sugar. this morning. Do not just eat simple carbs for breakfast. What's wrong with the world? Anyway. Don't get me started. So maybe the person having SlimFast can be teaching the other family members how to eat better. And we're actually doing family-based interventions because I think it's really important in these families where there's higher risk to get everybody eating better. But I do know that patients who really are interested in maintaining weight loss can use it part of the time. So as opposed to in the intensive phase, if, you know, if they're just racing out the door, they can grab a SlimFast and consume it and that if they want to eat on the weekends or whatever with their families, that can be a different thing. I certainly think it's a better choice for a lot of people than bariatric surgery, which obviously works, but has a whole host of other behavioral changes you have to make. So if there's a simple way to get people to eat more healthy, even 20% of the time, I think it makes a difference. And again, you know, it's not, it's, it's, it's a process. I don't like diets. I like people to change their health habits, but in the look ahead study, that's how we got those people to lose 10% or more of their body weight. It was the most effective tool we had. Dr. Hyman, how they, you know, cure diabetes with diet, like it's all nutritarian. And I was wondering if you're familiar with those or. So the question is about people on television talking about how to lose diet, I mean, different doctors. The thing is, is that you can make diabetes, type 2 diabetes go away in most cases just by eating better. I mean, you don't need some magical thing. There is no magic to type, you know, losing weight. You just have to do it. So, I mean, I've thought often that I could make a fortune writing some, you know, I just have, a, have a, a sexy title, and then you can make a fortune. Tell everybody to eat whatever you want. If you don't eat anything but, you know, cantaloupe, you're going to lose weight. Or I give you a pill and you think it. But I, I think the key is, A, to work with a really good, you know, team. And we've always had really good dietitians. And then to just eat in a healthier way, a lot more plant-based, you know, really trying to stay away from what's refined and a lot of simple carbs. And 
eat healthy fats. I mean, I just think you just have to tip it a little to be healthier. And I think we've gotten tipped the wrong way. And so no fats. If, I, if people come to me with something, I heard it on TV, I say, yeah, and it's that guy, you know, living in a mansion. And if the answer is yes, well, maybe we'll consider it. But no, I mean, there is no magic to this. Otherwise, we'd have it fixed. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Peters. Great talk.